for this week's Challenge Wednesday. All right, we have our patient, Carrie. And Carrie presents with persistent pelvic girdle pain when ambulating long distances. Upon examination, the patient's left lower extremity is shorter than the right and supine, but longer when long sitting. Which of the following is the most effective intervention to address the patient's condition? So we have A, hook lying with patient isometrically resisting hip flexion on the left. B, hook lying, single leg bridging on the left. C is step ups to an eight inch step with the left lower extremity leading. And D is right side lying, resisted left hip abduction. All right. So let's let's knock this one down. Let's start off at the top. Again, we have Carrie. And Carrie presents with persistent pelvic girdle pain. All right, cool. And now that's when she's ambulating long distances. All right, so I'm getting a, an idea of what's kind of going on here, but that doesn't really tell us much of anything at this point, right? But then it says, upon examination, the patient's left lower extremity is shorter than the right and supine. All right, let me read that again. Upon examination, the patient's left lower extremity is shorter than the right and supine, but then longer when long sitting. All right, so I want to slow up real quick there because that's really important because if a person has a true leg length discrepancy, right, one leg is truly longer than the other, then we would expect that leg to remain long regardless. Would you agree with that? So if she had a longer left leg, like it was, it was structurally longer, then we would expect it to be longer regardless of whether she's sitting or long sitting or supine or whatever it is. We would expect it to be longer. Now, here's the deal. It says that the left lower extremity is shorter than the right and supine, but then becomes longer. And see, there's something special about that. Because what can happen is if we have like uh, this, this anominate rotation, it can make a leg appear longer can make a, a leg appear shorter as well all right and we have a special test that we use for that and a lot of you may know that as the supine to sit test you need to know this for the mpte's very very common all right and that's where we have the patient lie in supine we're checking their malleoli bilaterally and seeing how one leg compares to the other and that's exactly what we're seeing here, that's what it's describing. It says, upon examination, the patient's left lower extremity is shorter than the right and supine. All right, so we're checking that out. Left lower extremity shorter. But then when the patient goes into the long sitting of the test, now the left leg appears longer. And so in order for you to really follow this question down and start to dissect the answer choices and dominate it, you have to understand that test. You have to understand what it means to get this result, and then we can progress forward, all right? So before I really give more of that answer to that specific, uh, that specific question, let's look at the question stem. It says, which of the following is the most effective intervention to address the patient's condition? Boom. So right there, we have to know what is that special test telling us? All right, let me tell you something. With that supine to sit test, if the left leg appears shorter than the right in supine and then becomes longer, we call that a posteriorly rotated anominate on the left. Let me say that again. A posteriorly rotated anominate on the left. That tells me something great right now because it tells me, okay, if the left side is posteriorly rotated, I need some intervention that is now going to help bring it back into its neutral position, aka I need something that's going to anteriorly rotate it, right? I mean, slow up for a minute and let's make sure that we're all on the same page. If my left anominate is rotated posteriorly, then common sense tell, uh, tells us that we would need to rotate it anteriorly right bring it back towards its neutral position and that's the exact thing that i'm looking for in my answers i need to find something that's going to bring it back into its neutral position 
All right, so let's look at these answer choices again. It says A, hook lying with the patient isometrically resisting hip flexion on the left. B, hook lying, single leg bridging on the left. C, step ups to an eight inch step with the left lower extremity leading. And D, right side lying resisted left hip abduction. All right, so let's start off with a hook line with this patient isometrically resisting the hip flexion on the left. Let me tell you something. You want to have that anominate go back into neutral position. I have to select a muscle group. I have to activate a muscle group that's going to pull it anteriorly. And so I need you to think about that for a moment. Well, what muscle group can I activate that is going to produce an anterior rotation of the anominate. Is that going to be the hamstrings? Is that going to be the glute max, glute med, hip flexors? Like, what are we looking at? What is going to create that anterior rotation? And so I like A because A has the patient in hook line, okay, isometrically resisting hip flexion. Well, I know that my hip flexors, iliopsoas, uh, and also the, the quads, all right, rectus femoris, I should say specifically, they're going to assist with an anterior rotation. I like that. The one thing I do not want is anything that's going to create a posterior rotation. Do not want that because the patient's already in that position. All right, so we're trying to fix it. I love A. A works right now. Doesn't mean it's the right answer, but A works because it's going to rotate it, uh, rotate the anominate anteriorly. Let's look at B, hook lying, single leg bridging on the left. Hmm. My question to you is if we do a single leg bridge on the left, what muscle group is that going to activate? Let's ask that question. All right. I, I really want you to think about this. Put it down right now. What is that muscle group or groups that it's going to activate? You should be saying, well, it could activate the glute max. Correct. Right. We're on the same page there, that hip extensor. But what other muscle group? It can activate hamstrings as well, correct? All right. Those are also hip extensors. And so my final question before we roll in or roll out this answer choice is, does the glute max and the hamstrings, do they do a posterior rotation or do they do an anterior rotation? And you should be saying to me that they do a posterior. Well, the patient's already in a posterior rotated anominate. We don't want to make it worse. And so B would be the exact opposite of what we want to do. I don't like it. B's out. Definitely out. Let's look at C. Step ups to an eight inch step with the left lower extremity leading. Okay, we're going to ask the same exact questions here. Same exact questions. Patient is stepping up to the eight inch step with the left lower extremity. What muscle group am I primarily working with or firing or contracting? All right. I, I, I know that I've gotten some people that said, well, you know, it's the quads. You'll be using the quads and that there is some truth to that. But there's also more muscle groups than that you're, you're firing. And that should be your glute max, right? Because your glute max is responsible for that hip extension that's going to occur. So it's both a glute max and you also got quads. If anything, we're going to have a counterbalancing type of thing going on. They're not going to neg negate each other. Because you're going to have the glute max firing and the quads firing. Again, that's really not going to give us the best, the best type of anterior rotation of the anominate. All right. It's not going to help us out as much as A was going to help us out. All right. Even if you made somewhat of a case for it, it's still not the best answer. It's still not the most effective intervention. All right. I'm, I'm still not going to choose that. I don't feel good about C. Let's look at D. Right side lying resisted left hip abduction. All right, so the patient's lying on the right side and they're doing hip abduction on the left. Okay, I like the fact that they're addressing the left side. That makes sense. But the fact that they change planes on me, right? Now, hip abduction is in the frontal plane and this is a sagittal plane problem. All right, and so right there, I automatically start shaking my head at the question like, what? Nah, get out of here. That's not even in the right plane. I am a thousand percent confident that that's not the answer because it's just not addressing what we need to address. And that should be a surefire one we can eliminate pretty darn quickly. 
And so just looking at what we have right now, it leaves us with our final answer of, of A, hook lying with the patient isometrically resisting hip flexion on the left. That is the right answer. If you got this answer correct, congratulations. All right, if you didn't get this question correct, you know, this is an area right here where a lot of students get these questions wrong because it's, you got to understand the special test. You got to understand what the special test is doing. Remember, that's a supine to sit. You got to understand what it means when the leg goes from short to long or long to short. You have to understand that. And then you got to figure out what intervention is going to be used in order to address that. There's quite a few steps that you have to go through to get this right answer. I will tell you that there is a mnemonic that I use for this supine to sit test. All right. And the, the, the mnemonic or the saying that I always use is all patients with ALS use or need SLP. Let me say it again. All patients with ALS need SLP. And so what that really means as far as that supine to sit test is that AL, you heard me say ALS, right? And so that means anteriorly rotated always goes from long to short in the supine to sit test. An anteriorly rotated anominate always goes from long to short, ALS, right? But when we have a posteriorly, posteriorly rotated anominate, it goes from short to long. So this is going to be a speech language pathology or SLP. It's going to go short to long is posteriorly rotated anominate. All right. And so that's how I always remember it. Patients with ALS need SLP. And again, that means anteriorly rotated anominate goes from long to short. And when it goes from short to long, it's a posteriorly rotated anominate. That's the, the, the kind of mnemonic that I always use for that. And it makes sense to me because patients who have ALS or Lou Gehrig's syndrome, all right, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, they need speech language pathology, right? Because they have things like dysphagia and dysarthria, all right? And so that is what I use. And I, I always want you to remember that the supine to sit test and understanding it is super important for these types of questions because it's really going to tell you what the problem is. And then the next piece is just figuring out what muscle group do I need to activate in order to pull my anominate back towards the neutral position. That is it.